Hi, very good morning to all those who have uh, logged in into Zoom platform for this uh, UM at uh, breakfast at UM Health. So um, let me introduce uh, Dr. Jaya, Jaya Sakti. Dr. Jaya Sakti is uh, from the Department of ENT and she's one of our senior lecturers. Um, Dr. Jaya Sakti um, has a special interest in, in uh, pediatrics and she's currently pursuing her subspeciality training in it and is also pursuing a PhD in, in particular on uh, vestibular disorders in the pediatric group. And uh, so today her topic is about a dizzy child, a rather uncommon problem, of, but likely also underdiagnosed. So let us hear Jaya shed some light on this issue for us, Jaya. Hi, good morning all. Um, I'll share my slides. Okay. Good morning all. Um, I'm Jaya Shakti Sanyasyaya. I'm um, from the pediatrics ENT team. Today, I would like to talk on dizziness in children. And I would also like to share my experience uh, with pediatric vestibular and balance clinic here in UMMC. So let's first start with the definition. So, you know, when you say dizziness, vertigo and unsteadiness, I'm sure you've all heard of different terms um, as such. So is it all the same and how different is it? So dizziness is an umbrella term that can be applied to a multitude of different symptoms that causes disturbance in spatial perception. So when you say vertigo, vertigo is illusion of movement of either self or environment, and it's related to vestibular lesion. Imbalance, on the other hand, is feeling of being unstable while seated standing or walking without a particular directional preference. So, you know, when you say dizziness, this includes sensation, which is sometimes referred to giddiness, uh, lightheadedness or non-specific dizziness. So the prevalence of dizziness in children ranges between 0.7 and 15%. Dizziness in children and adults are different. You know, uh, when you say um, 0 0.7 to 15%, though the numbers may actually be higher. Now you may wonder why when I say, um, you know, the numbers may be higher and we have never encountered them frequently. So dizziness in children and adults are different and children uh, don't typically present with presentations like spinning sensation as adults. Now, managing a dizzy child may be challenging owing to a few factors. The first is child finds it difficult to verbalize dizzy symptomatology. They have short-lived nature and rapid compensation. So, you know, when the dizziness is associated with uh, vestibular loss, what happens is the entire nature of disease uh, occurs very quickly and there's rapid compensation. And by the time this child presents to the clinic, the classical diagnostic findings like nystagmus may not be present. So the other issue is short attention span. Because of this, um, each assessment needs to be tailored and modified. Of course, the lack of awareness. This is something that uh, we seem to have here in our country where Patients and parents, parents are not aware that the child may be dizzy and uh, many physicians are not aware how to manage um, a child with dizziness. And the other thing is definitely atypical presentation. So child may not typically present with spinning sensation as I mentioned and what happens is they may turn out to the clinic with symptoms like uh, delayed motor or speech development. Now, you know, traditionally, dizzy child has been uh, related to vestibular disease, but then there are other conditions which may lead to dizzy child, which includes vergence disorder, uh, psychiatric disorder like somatoform disorders, medication induced, and even cardiovascular and neurological complaints like uh, presence of brain tumor. Now, what happens um, with, so when it's vestibular induced dizziness, what happens 
what sort of conditions that may present with depends and differs according to age group. You know, this may range from congenital hearing loss to otitis media with effusion and vertiginous migraine in older children. So the Brodsky's group in Boston, they published an article on multifactorial characteristics of pediatric dizziness and uh, imbalance. In their group, they found 1,020 dizzy child and the mean age was 12.5. Out of this, um, they found that the most common diagnosis is vestibular migraine, followed by benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. And then there's the primary dysautonomia and somatoform disorder. So dizziness, so I'll just like to highlight that dizziness in children and adolescents are not the same. I recently published a review on vestibular dysfunction among adolescents, and I found that vestibular dysfunction in adolescents are multifactorial, and, there are, and they are usually attributed by conditions like cyber sickness, persistent postural uh, perceptual dizziness, somatoform disorder, orthostatic dizziness, and post-concussion. So why do we need to assess dizziness in children? Many studies have actually um, meant, uh, stated that effect of dizziness in children, which especially when it's secondary to vestibular causes, leads to delay in motor and balance development. So the child with uh, vestibular loss tends to walk, stand and sit at a later age compared to the age matched peers. Next is, of course, learning disabilities, which requires visual tasks. And because of the impairment in gaze stabilizing function, children with vestibular loss tends to become either slow learners or they have um, learning disabilities. This in turn impairs scholastic performance. And of course, it impairs uh, psychosocial and overall quality of life. Now, how can we approach First and foremost, I think it's important to get thorough history from parents or caretaker or the child itself when possible. You know, asking questions like uh, frequent falls or clumsy, child has difficulty in climbing or descending stairs, child is nauseated in car, has tendency to bump into objects or misjudge distances, either the child dislikes swings or has difficulty to learn to ride a bicycle. You know, other related a uh, history that may point towards vestibular loss um, should be obtained, such as her hearing loss, medication induced, and concussion history. Now, it's important to inquire the child's development milestone because this can point towards if the child um, is appropriate, has appropriate developmental growth. Well, we have uh, several questionnaires uh, to assess the child's overall vestibular function as well as symptoms. Here in uh, UMMC, I use the Vanderbilt Pediatric Dizziness Handicap Inventory. So besides that, there are myriads of uh, objective and subjective assessments. Well, we have objective assessments, both objective and subjective assessment to assess each part of the vestibular end organs. So just to briefly explain, there are five vestibular end organs, which are PET, three semicircular canal, the otholith organs, which is the utricle and saccule. So to assess the otholith organs, we use the VEM, vestibular evoked myogenic potential. Um, it's either cervical or the ocular. And then to assess the semicircular function, we use uh, a video head and pulse test, which, uh, which is able to assess each of the semicircular canal individually. So, you know, I'd like to highlight that although there are tons of um, objective and subjective assessments, it's important not to forget basic examinations like otoscopic examinations, because um, middle ear effusion may actually be one of the culprit. You know, something as simple as middle ear effusion, which causes vestibular loss may be, may be missed. So I would really like to highlight the importance of a multidisciplinary team um, to manage uh, a dizzy child. At the same time, it's also important to collaborate with other centers and expertise to get their opinion. 
Well, I'll move on to uh, case presentations, which we have managed here in UMMC. The first case, this is a 10-year-old boy uh, who presented to our clinic with a complaint of spinning sensation and headache. The headache is either occasionally unilateral or bilateral, and it's usually at the frontal temporal region. Uh, there's, you know, the symptoms, they alternate. It's occasionally, it's spinning sensation first followed by headache, and sometimes it's headache first followed by spinning sensation. And the child has about three to four episodes per week, each lasting about 30 to 60 minutes, and he requires paracetamol each episode. So the quality of life score, so usually I take a severity uh, score index each, uh, each visit to the clinic, and he was eight. The only positive history in this child is his motion sickness, and the mother has history of migraine. So the blood investigations, uh, vision tests, imaging, and neurological assessments were all normal. Audiological assessments and basic ENT assessments were also normal. So I performed a thorough vestibular assessment and balance assessment, which was also within the normal range. So based on this child's diagnostic, um, you know, based on this child's symptoms and his findings, uh, he was diagnosed with vertiginous migraine of childhood. So his symptoms fulfills the diagnostic criteria, which was um, published recently in 2021 by the Barani Consensus Group. Besides that, besides his positive symptoms, um, presence of motion sickness and also first having first degree relative of uh, migraine points towards vertiginous migraine. So I started this child on flunorizin as a calcium channel blocker. So uh, there has been many papers published on um, good outcome of flunorizin, both to treat and also to prevent recurrence. And I have seen very good outcome among the patients, especially children that I started flunorizin on. So one more thing that I would like to highlight, and I usually highlight to the parents, is lifestyle modification. I usually take time to explain to parents, you know, it's important to make sure that a child has adequate sleep, exercises, has healthy meals, and most importantly, of course, is to reduce screen time because this may be the triggering factor. Okay, one more thing that actually helps is having a dizziness, a symptom diary, so that the child gets to jot down each time, you know, he's either feeling dizzy or um, he's having spinning sensation. So, for an older child, they're able to do it themselves or the parents uh, will help out in younger children. So supplements like, I usually prescribe child with uh, magnesium tablets. There has been uh, literature on good outcome in children taking magnesium and riboflavin tablets. So this child um, currently has no recurrence for more than two months and his overall severity index is zero. I'll move on to the next case. This is a four-year-old kid and her only, uh, you know, the parent's only concern was that the child was only able to verbalize under 10 words and they had no other concern. So for a four-year-old child, she should be able to construct four or more word sentence. Well, upon further questioning, parents claim that the child frequently bumps into cupboard, um, is clumsy, and has severe motion sickness. So when I say uh, motion sickness, this is an exaggerated motion sickness. So we performed a single leg stance test. So this test basically requires the child to stand on a single leg, alternating on the right and then followed by the left, with eyes open and without, um, with eyes open and closed. So, um, and I compare it with the normative data and you can see that the child is unable to uh, stand on a single leg. So the vestibular assessment performed showed that the child has autolith dysfunction. So autolith organs are the saccule and utricle based on the assessments performed. The semicircular canal functions were within normal range. I mean, yeah. The other ENT assessments and hearing assessments were normal. And this child was diagnosed as delayed postural motor syndrome. So this is a part of sensory integrative disorder. 
child was referred to the occupational therapy, physiotherapy, and of course, speech therapy, um, and also to the multidisciplinary unit. Um, I prescribed the child with vestibular rehabilitation therapy. So um, it's vestibular exercises, which incorporates adaptation exercises with cognitive tasks. So we'll move on to the final case. This is, um, there are two cases with similar presentation. This is a 12 year old boy and the next was an eight year old girl, which we just saw recently. Both has history of motion sickness and they presented with imbalance and giddiness um, associated with COVID uh, during the COVID symptoms. So what happened to them is uh, following recovering after recovering from COVID, the symptoms persisted and the dizziness was alternating with headache. And this, for the boy, it was screen time that was aggravating and his severity index was seven. And for the girl, the severity score was five. We performed vestibular tests, which were all within normal range. So I'd like to um, highlight here that this patient came to our clinic after five to seven months of symptoms. So, you know, because of um, short-lived nature and rapid and early compensation, this is why the vestibular tests were all within normal range. The child was subsequently referred to the multidisciplinary unit um, and was diagnosed with vestibular neuritis post-COVID and vertiginous migraine. So now, vertiginous migraine, can it be a part of long COVID syndrome is still being investigated. So child was managed uh, with lifestyle modification, headache was controlled with ibuprofen and vestibular rehabilitation therapy. Again, um, the vestibular exercises where child performs cognitive tasks while sitting on a balance ball. So uh, vestibular exercises, usually I tailor them according to age and the child's um, overall cognitive function. So dizziness in COVID-19 has been reported. I published a review on dizziness and COVID-19, and this was among adult patients. So in children, there has been only one case report on uh, COVID-19-induced vestibular neuritis, which uh, resolved within uh, two months, uh, sorry, two weeks. So what about vertiginous migraine? So whether or not vertiginous migraine is a part of long COVID syndrome is still being investigated. We are sending our two case series for publication. I've also discussed this case with the other um, pediatric vestibular center specialists. I've actually come to the end of my talk. So can a child be dizzy? Yes, a child can be dizzy. Um, it helps to look out for red flags like, you know, frequent fall of clumsy, delay in developmental milestone or exaggerated motion sickness. I would also like to highlight uh, the importance of multidisciplinary team evaluation because of uh, the multitude of um, causes of dizziness. So here in UMMC, we have a pediatrics vestibular and balance clinic, which is the only one in the country. And um, I have currently a few ongoing studies on different conditions that causes um, vestibular loss in children. If you have any patients that you would like to have uh, a vestibular, you know, child to have a vestibular assessment, please feel free to refer to us. And thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jaya, for shedding light on the, this uh, very um, not so common problem, but I suppose um, it's probably really underdiagnosed. Um, as we can see that uh, some of the symptoms are really non-specific, things like falls, motion sickness, which I suppose a lot of children have. But I believe it's a constellation of symptoms rather than just a single symptom. Um, you know, that, that would, should raise the um, concern for parents and also uh, healthcare workers to bring this child for this assessment. Um, and also, it's really important, as uh, Dr. Jaya has highlighted, that, you know, it has negative impact on their learning. 
So it's very important that they are diagnosed early and treated. And we can see the treatment can be either in the form, form of pharmacotherapy or vestibular rehabilitations. Um, I just want to ask Dr. Jaya whether do you send them to the um, uh, rehab uh, physicians or all of this are done by yourself alone? So um, I do collaborate with the rehab team, but the vestibular exercises in children, I'm coming up with a protocol and I'm trying out different exercises with them. And this I'm collaborating with another pediatric vestibular clinic uh, in Alderhey, Liverpool. So, yeah. So this um this is something this is something very new, right? This vestibular rehabilitation for children. Yes, yes, it's, it's not really been established here. Yeah. yeah. So so it will be good to see what is the outcome uh, of the clinic that you have uh, started running, and we are very fortunate to have you here. Thank you, Professor. Uh, and uh, I'd like to see if there's any questions for you. Is there any Shams? None that I can see so far. And um, if none, then I think probably should we move on to the next? I have no further questions. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to all the attendees. Uh, the next presenter will be from Pediatric Cardiology Unit, uh, Department of Pediatrics. So um, I'm introducing Dr. Noor Intan Aliana, who is our next presenter. Dr. Noor Intan is a, a young pediatrician who obtained her master in pediatrics from University of Malaya in 2019. And uh, after being gazetted by Ministry of Health, she joined uh, UMMC as a clinical specialist. And uh, she is currently in her first year uh, training in pediatric cardiology. So today, Dr. Intan will be talking on a topic titled um, Down syndrome with pulmonary hypertension, uh, which is a challenge in uh, diagnosis and management in this uh, vulnerable group of uh, patients. So without further ado, I'll pass over the Zoom floor to Dr. Noor Intan. Over to you, Intan. Yeah, Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to all the audience. Thank you, Prof. Noraza, for the kind introduction. I am uh, Norin Tanliana, pediatrician from the Pediatric Cardiology Unit Team in UMMC. We would like to present on uh, our experience uh, on Down syndrome with pulmonary hypertension. Okay. The incidence of pulmonary hypertension in Down syndrome population is up to 25% of uh, uh, of children. And this incidence uh, can be increased up to 45% if they were presented also with a congenital heart disease. And even without the congenital heart disease, this overall incidence of pulmonary hypertension in this Down syndrome population is higher compared to the general population. When the country of origin were analyzed uh, in one of the systematic review, it was noted that Asian population are higher compared to the non-Asian continent account for 38.4% versus 19.8. And the overall prevalence in female was 26.2% and in male was 24.3%. The timing of onset of pulmonary hypertension in this Down syndrome appear to be commonly in their first year of life, particularly when they also presented with a persistent pulmonary hypertension of newborn or PPHN or in the patient with associated congenital heart disease. And in one of the moderately sized uh, retrospective studies has shown that 70% of this Down syndrome with pulmonary hypertension had a transient disease and actually has a complete resolution. However, a small percentage of them with 15% actually have a persistent pulmonary hypertension and in about 15% of them had a recurrent pulmonary hypertension, means they are already resolved, but it recur again. And from this study, the median age of recurrence is uh, one and a half years old. And this group of patients usually uh, frequently associated with the respiratory comorbidities. And the challenge part are the pulmonary hypertension in Down syndrome are not always symptomatic, especially in the center without the echocardiograph, uh, echocardiography, or cardiac catheterization. The, Estimation population might be uh, underestimating in the prevalence of a real uh, pulmonary hypertension in Down syndrome. 
And in a large population study in US also showed there are increased morbidity and mortality with increased odd ratio of death in 3.8. It indicate uh, the burden of a pulmonary vascular disease is uh, higher in the patients with Down syndrome and pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension is actually defined when there is an increase in the mean pulmonary artery pressure more than 25 to maintain their pulmonary blood flow with no evidence of left arterial hypertrophy. The etiology of pulmonary hypertension in Down syndrome uh, is not always straightforward. The researchers have found that extra copies of their 21 chromosomes may have correlation with extra genes in their 21 chromosome that regulates in the lung or in the endothelial development. Uh, but however, um, other factors such, for example, increase in hemodynamic stress, congenital heart disease, PDA or PPHN, uh, increase in the pro-inflammatory mediators, or also like others, uh, for example, obstructive sleep apnea, capillary or post-capillary disorder added to the these risk factors in the developing of pulmonary hypertension in Down syndrome patient. Children with Down syndrome with congenital heart disease are more likely to experience the pulmonary hypertension. It's found that there are five times likelihood to experience increase in the risk of pulmonary hypertension. However, there are small case series also have been reported the evidence of uh, abnormality in the lung development, for example, in patients with uh, pulmonary hypoplasia in the individual with Down syndrome. And not to forget, obstructive sleep apnea also carries uh, up to 79% risk uh, in the patient with Down syndrome, and it may lead to the contribution of pulmonary hypertension in this group of children. When a Down syndrome child uh, had underwent uh, evaluation on their airways, they found up to 70% has abnormalities in their airway, which uh, commonly reported uh, tracheobronchomalacia and followed by subglottic stenosis. And the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension can be supported by identifying the right ventricular hypertension. When we can see uh, changes in the echocardiogram, for example, one, we can see the flattening of interventricular septum, two, right to left shunt at the ductal level, three, the dilated right-sided cardiac chambers, and four, increased uh, peak, uh, tricuspid regurgitation more than 40%. When we combine these uh, features of uh, right-sided uh, changes, it can give the higher predictability of echo finding for pulmonary hypertension. These are the, the echo finding example. We can see that the right side of the heart chamber are enlarged with a high uh, tricuspid regurgitation. When we do Doppler, they got a high uh, tricuspid regurgitation jet. And we can see from the lower slide, the flattening of the uh, interventricular septum. The World Symposium of Pulmonary Hypertension uh, in 2018 has classified this pulmonary hypertension into five major groups, which includes group one in pulmonary arterial hypertension, for example, in a patient with a congenital heart disease or in the patient with PPHN, group two, pulmonary hypertension due to left-sided heart disease, Group 3, pulmonary hypertension due to lung disease or hypoxemia, for example, in the sleep breathing disorder or developmental lung disease. Group 4, pulmonary hypertension due to pulmonary arterial obstruction. Group 5, with uh, pulmonary hypertension, unclear mechanism. However, uh, Down syndrome, they have noted at mostly attributed to the group 1, but it can be under-reporting of the other group because in one patient with Down syndrome, they can have other comorbidity, for example, lung development disorder or in the patient with uh, thyroid disorders. So actually, the screening guideline for population uh, Down syndrome with uh, pulmonary hypertension or at risk of developing pulmonary hypertension are quite limited as there is no consensus accepted guideline. But a recent publication by the Pulmonary Hypertension Association has suggested a comprehensive approach includes uh, the echocardiography screening, for example, they suggested to be done in the first month of life, uh, screen for the swallowing disorder in a child with, uh, who, are, who are symptomatic, and also screening for sleep breathing disorder by the age of four years old, and other screening, for example, uh, thyroid uh, metabolic screening. 
uh, this more specific immunomodulators uh, and biomarkers to detect on early pulmonary hypertension are still currently under investigated. So I would like to share on our one-year audit on Down syndrome with uh, pulmonary hypertension in UMMC. So uh, from January to December 2021, we have 14 patients uh, with Down syndrome and 64.3%, uh, nine of them are female and uh, five of them are male with a malaise contribute to 71.4% in 10 of the patient and most of the patient are term gestation in 78.6%, which is 11 out of 14. And it was 13 out of 14, which are 93% had other comorbidities and most common comorbids are congenital heart disease followed by chronic lung disease and thyroid disorders. When we look at the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension in these children, uh, we found that four of them had documented the RJET more than 40 on their first echocardiogram. But however, in one patient, we are unable to determine due to the complexity of the congenital heart disease. So 11 out of uh, this patient had RV dilatation and RV flattening on their first echocardiogram. And when we combination the clinical diagnosis and echocardiographic finding, our patient, we found the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension was high in 50% of them. In half of the patient, 7 out of 14 of this patient. Uh, as I mentioned, the worldwide incident range from 25%. However, uh, India uh, had a small studies, uh, found uh, incidence about the same, about 51% of their patient with pulmonary hypertension. And six of these patients with pulmonary hypertension had a cardiac defect in which uh, uh, three of them are severe cardiac defect and two of them are moderate cardiac defect. One are mild, one is mild cardiac defect and one had no cardiac defect. When we look at the Down syndrome with this cardiac defect and pulmonary hypertension, all 50% uh, of them, three of them had underwent a surgical correction. 33 of them, two of them had spontaneous closure in one moderate cardiac defect and one spontaneous closure in mild cardiac defect. However, we have one uh, patient uh, had underwent conservative management in the moderate cardiac defect due to have a pulmonary hypertensive crisis. Uh, when we look at the seven uh, patient with uh, pulmonary hypertension, the outcome, um, three, uh, forty-three percent of the, the the percentage, three out of seven, had um, mild pulmonary hypertension, and they are all resolved. While one had uh, moderate pulmonary hypertension and is actually persists, and there are three, which is forty-three percent of them had also a severe pulmonary hypertension, which is uh, one is a recurrence and two are persistent until now. When we look at a pulmonary hypertension treatment, seventy percent, which is five out of seven, was started on oral sildenafil and four out of five had moderate to severe and still ongoing treatment. One, we have a mild pulmonary hypertension and only able to off oxygen at day 11 of life. Two of them require total duration of oxygen range from 16 to 21 days and two still ongoing oxygen support currently eight months old and one year, three months old and one death in our patient. Okay, I would like to present on the, our spectrum of Down syndrome with uh, pulmonary hypertension in UMMC. So we have case one, eight months old girl, born term, good weight, 3.7. She's tachypneic from birth, treated for pneumonia. The echocardiography screening shows a large cardiac defect. She requires OptiFlow 14, 14 days or uh, non-invasive ventilation for five days. She required a total duration of oxygen for 22 days in her first uh, month of life. She also developed early signs of uh, heart failure and she was started on uh, anti-failure as early as day 12 of life. However, unfortunately, she was admitted for pneumonia at three months old with uh, positive culture and chest x-ray changes. At this time, she required ICU admission intubated for four days and NIV until she was scheduled for cardiac surgery. 
she was scheduled for cardiac surgery uh, quite early at four months old due to the condition and intraoperatively noted she had uh, postoperatively she had a refractory chylothorax and she was diagnosed during this time as a pulmonary hypertension and was uh, ventilated for total for four days and started on sildenafil. At five months old, she had another episode of infection and COVID infection also uh, with positive cultures. And this time also she required ICU and NIV with uh, persistent chest X-ray changes. So uh, we classified, uh, uh, we, 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 we asked for our respiratory colleague uh, consultation and um, now she's eight months old and still ongoing oxygen and uh, sildenafil therapy. So she, we classified her as a persistent pulmonary hypertension. This uh, example of her uh, eco finding shows at birth uh, right there's changes in the right ventricle with high uh, TR jet more than forty, and then at six week, weeks old she had also similar changes with a higher TR jet during that time she was having an infection, and three months old prior to cardiac surgery she had uh, LV and right ventricle changes with a uh, high TR jet. And the last echo after operation, she still has uh, some uh, RV dilatation, but improvement uh, in the interventricular flattening with a uh, uh, TR jet still high. That's why we classified her as a persistent pulmonary hypertension. So when we look at the common BGT, this child, uh, despite had surgery, uh, she, she still require long-term oxygen therapy and our respiratory clinic had, uh, did the bronchoscopy shows she had a um, malacic airway and plan for home CPAP. Case two is a three months old girl. She is uh, also a good weight term child. Tachypne intubated since birth initially was treated as severe PPHN. It, the first equal show dilated right chambers with moderate uh, intracardiac shunt. Uh, she had required high ventilatory support and inotropic support. She was extubated at day 10 of life. She was started uh, sildenafil quite early and also heart failure medication at day 11, at 17 of life. However, she was never discharged uh, from hospital. At one month old, she had another recurrent episode of pneumonia with pulmonary hypertensive crisis, and she needed the non-invasive ventilatory support. At two months old, she required re-intubation and ventilated for 10 days, and a pulmonary consultation has done, uh, shows... Uh, uh, no, and also we did uh, ask for pulmonary consultation. She's unable to win off the NIV support. And then we um, scheduled her for the cardiac catheterization. Uh, unfortunately, it was abandoned uh, due to pulmonary hypertensive crisis during GA induction. Uh, but unfortunately, this patient's come, but we uh, classified her as a persistent pulmonary hypertension. So, again, the eco findings show RV changes, dilatations, and also high TR jet. Uh, at one month old, uh, with a high TR jet and also RV dilatation, and prior to catheterization and succumb, she also had uh, similar changes. When we look at the comorbidities, uh, she had a multiple comorbidities. She, uh, she had severe pulmonary hypertension since birth, and uh, because of all this comorbidity, lung infection, tracheobronchial anomalies, obstructive sleep apneas, CHD, metabolic diseases, uh, parents opted for conservative management. And then the last case I would like to share is uh, our uh, one year, three months old girl, also birth uh, term, uh, good weight 3.1 to take it since birth, treated as a, a PPHN equals show small defect. Uh, but she required high ventilatory support and able to be extubated at two weeks of life. She was NIV dependent until two months old and started sildenafil quite early. Uh, but somehow the subsequent echo shows uh, improvement in the pulmonary hypertensive changes and the sildenafil was stopped at two months old. However, at three months old, she was uh, admitted for respiratory infection, required prolonged uh, ventilation and also NIV support with X-rays and uh, uh, pneumonia changes. Uh, since that, she was unable to wind down the NIV support. And at nine months old, a respiratory consultation was done. And during that time, issue screening shows severe pulmonary hypertensive changes. However, the, the cardiac had spontaneously closed. Uh, but then because of these changes, we have restarted her on sildenafil. 
and subsequently had uh, another admission but currently she was uh, she is CPAP dependent with uh, ongoing treatment so we classified her as a recurrence and persistent pulmonary hypertension so this is again her eco finding shows initially high TRJ at birth but subsequently the TRJ has been normal with uh, improvement uh, of the RV uh, morphology and then when she was referred to UMMC, uh, the intracardiac structure has been uh, spontaneously closed, uh, but she noted to have the RV changes with very high TRJ to 91. And after she was started on treatment, the echocardiogram was improved with uh, uh, improvement in the tricuspid reverse jet. Okay, uh, the pulmonary hypertension in this child is uh, already uh, resolved, but recur despite of the spontaneous closure of the CHD. So we have to look back all at the comorbidities that the patient might have. This patient had also uh, multiple comorbids, fish prong disease, metabolic disease, uh, thyroid disorder, obstructive sleep apnea, severe trachea and chronic aspiration. And this patient was planned for cardiac catheterization in the future for objective hemodynamic assessment. Multi uh, management of uh, Down syndrome with uh, pulmonary hypertension again uh, it also uh, a multidisciplinary approach. We need. Uh, pediatric cardiology, respiratory surgery, our ENT click, anesthesia, and intensive care. So early recognition of uh, pulmonary hypertension as well as recognition of the associated comorbidities is very important. And the intervention and treatment should be targeted to the comorbidities. And there are study reported that by addressing the upper AWA has improved in the mean uh, pulmonary arterial pressure on the cardiac catheterization and the importance of early closure of this cardiac defect. And uh, the targeted pharmacotherapy, for example, sildenafil or more potent FDA approved uh, bosentin. What we can we learn? Children with Down syndrome have increased risk of developing PPH and even uh, in the absence of structural heart disease. Uh, Smith has been reported that Down syndrome had higher prevalence of pulmonary hypertension with or without uh, cardiac disease and in the patient with a normal heart further investigation is mandatory to determine the causes of pulmonary hypertension early intervention with surgery for congenital heart or management of obstructed airway to help to prevent the pulmonary arterial hypertension progression and cardiac catheterization also carry a high risk for general anesthesia and need to be performed in the specialized center and pulmonary hypertension in this group of children can recur and can progress, especially in uh, Down syndrome with multiple comorbidity. So the importance of screening and follow-up when necessary, especially when she develop a new symptoms. So as a conclusion, uh, it's a uh, rare but uh, common in the Down syndrome population. So multifactorial reasons need to be excluded and by underlying the etiologies and the comorbidity will help us in guideline uh, guiding the management strategies. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nur Intan, for keeping uh, to the time. And uh, thank you for enlightening us with a very comprehensive uh, talk on uh, Down syndrome with pulmonary hypertension. So, so even though most of our patients are uh, of transient disease, but we are also seeing uh, more and more of the uh, symptomatic uh, Down syndrome with pulmonary hypertension. And, and I agree with you that it's a very difficult population to manage um, because uh, they don't come with only one etiology. Instead, uh, they came with multiple etiologies and uh, the treatment are also very, very limited in pediatric population. So let's go to the uh, questions. Um, Okay, let me see. Okay. Uh, okay, other questions. Okay. So, um, this question from Dr. Chua Is it possible for pulmonary hypertension to be detected in utero? Dr. Intan? Uh, for me, it's uh, quite challenging as uh, in utero uh, fetal circulation, they also had the uh, right ventricle dominant as their systemic ventricles. So it's, it's, uh, it's also a, a very difficult uh, uh, finding, I mean, uh, to diagnose them in utero. 
that's why even though they are postnatal, we have also difficulty in screening them and ECHO can only found in if they having a late changes, for example, right ventricle uh, uh, hypertension. Okay, uh, there's, a, there's a, another question uh, from Prof. YK. Interesting presentation. Would pulmonary hypertension, whether diagnosed or not, be mainly responsible for a shortened lifespan in this population generally? What uh, do you think? It's uh, again, Prof, the, the question. Um, would pulmonary hypertension be mainly responsible for a shortened lifespan? It's actually they found a uh, higher incidence of pulmonary hypertension compared to before uh, because I have a uh, uh, increased survival of this group of children. Last time in the patient with Down syndrome with uh, congenital heart disease, uh, they are more uh, to be conservatively managed and their pulmonary hypertension not frequently pick up. But nowadays when we did early surgery for this group of patients, that's where we found a uh, uh, higher uh, survival or higher incidence rate. And then these uh, confounding uh, factors come into which is a pulmonary hypertension that, that also uh, contribute on this, in this group of patients. Because last time, uh, most of them are conservatively managed. Yeah, yeah, I guess it's very difficult to objectively say that um, having pulmonary hypertension will reduce the lifespan because it also depends on the, on the severity of the pulmonary hypertension. The severe ones are definitely yeah, lifespan are shorter. That's that's what we saw because in pediatric, uh, the treatment is very very limited. Okay, another uh question from Prof YK is um. Uh, is there any um studies that show uh blood gases of this patient um, um you know to reflect uh hypoxia. Varying degree of hypoxia in patient with uh, Down syndrome and pulmonary hypertension. Um, I, I actually didn't uh, cross into that studies, but uh, as what uh, has been reported in most of the systematic reviews and recent studies, uh, the, 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 to diagnose early pulmonary hypertension in this group of children, they also agree it's quite challenging. And uh, the non-specific uh, blood gas uh, cannot be also a determined absolute on uh, the diagnosis of uh, pulmonary hypertension in this group of children. So they are studying on the endothelial uh, and also gene, gene studies, but they are all, all under uh, still under investigation. Yep, uh, I agree. I, I myself have not come across uh, any study show blood gases in this patient. So another comment from uh, Prof. Uh, YK regarding the question on uh, whether we can diagnose in utero. So uh, there is a limited flow in the pulmonary circulation in utero. So, um, so that's why it's very, very difficult to diagnose them uh, in utero. And also uh, pulmonary circulation can experience uh, hypoxic vessel constriction in utero. And the blood in the right ventricle is also diverted away from the lung circulation. Well, you know, it's, it's in the fetal circulation uh, physiology. So another question is, uh, is there any uh, predictors for comorbids in this patient in time related to severity of uh, pulmonary hypertension? Okay, I, I have come across uh, the risk factors uh, for developing pulmonary hypertension. Uh, the risk factors for uh, for mortality is not well established, but the risk factors for developing pulmonary hypertension, of course, one is the congenital heart disease itself. And they found out when they have a multiple comorbid at the same time, this group of patients had the higher risk to develop a severe type of pulmonary hypertension. So, because we tend to focus on one, uh, managing one treatment and uh, some of these patients may be uh, not well investigated for other comorbidity, for example, microaspiration because of the hypotonia. So, this can contribute to, 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 to the development of the severe pulmonary hypertension in this group of children, actually. 
just just like your case number two, right? With a lot of uh, comorbids and succumb in a very early, very early in life. So I think one last question from Dr. Wan. Do term down syndrome babies need screening echo? And uh, is it within one month of life or during admission? Uh, the suggested uh, from the AAP guideline, uh, they suggested at least at, uh, to be done at their first month because as we know, they are, the echocardiography is not available in most of the centres. But in the centres with the tertiary centres, uh, we suggest that uh, Down syndrome uh, should be surveillance of their heart as early as possible. Yeah. So, so here in UMMC, uh, we screen them before uh, they get discharged uh, from the ward after delivery. So uh, I think um, there's a very good, uh, very good questions and uh, very good discussions uh, going on uh, for this lecture. Thank you very much uh, for all the questions. And uh, thank you, Dr. Intan, uh, for the talk again. And uh, uh, I conclude that, um, so, so it is a very challenging population. And um, you know, objective assessment by cardiac catheterization is uh, very, very difficult um, in this patient. I mean, to get a uh, you know to to get them into a cath lab, especially when they are not uh, stable, like in a case number two. And um, um, I think the Seattle guideline is uh, very, very useful for general uh, pediatrician and physician. And um, we in the in our Down syndrome patient usually in the their first year of life we follow them up very 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 closely to um, to look for any development of pulmonary hypertension. Okay, thanks again and uh, yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Azza. Thank you.